chapter 16 and verses 19 to 20 and we'll be going through a number of verses this morning um, as we uh, go into God's word. Romans chapter 16 verses 19 to 20 if you're there say amen. amen. Romans 16 verse 19 says this for the reports of your obedience has reached to all therefore I am rejoicing over you but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. 
The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, Romans chapter 16, those familiar with the book of Romans, or if you open up your Bible, you can see that the next book of the Bible might even be on the same page or on the page just to the right or as you turn the page because Romans only has 16 chapters to it. So this is the last chapter of the book of Romans, which is the first as far as the way they place. It's not the first written time-wise by the Apostle Paul, but it's the first one written as you go in on the way they place to order the books in our Bibles. Romans is the first one that was written by Paul. You know, in the New Testament, you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, and then you have Romans. And so Romans is the first one that God used, the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write, and superintended to come to us in the canon of Scripture uh, down to us today. And so Romans is 16 chapters in length, and we are obviously, if it has 16 chapters, I'm getting back into math for tomorrow, that means it's the last chapter of this book. And in fact, if you're on your bulletin and you look at the other verses, although, you know, uh, you always hesitate to have you look farther down because then you're thinking about the other verses too, but they will all come to us from the last chapters of these various books written by the pen of the Apostle Paul through the inspiration of the Spirit, of course. And in fact, we will and take us two or three weeks, but we're going to go through all the books written by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament and go to the last chapter and close to the last verse. And here's why. There's going to be a common theme, and that theme is that of grace. You know, I like the uh, Gaither videos. How many here like the Gaither videos? Yes, yes, yes. I tell you, you're growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. <laughs> Those without your hand up, add them to the prayer request list. <laughs> I, I had a person one time, you, most of you know, I used to work at the Christian bookstore and I was uh, the assistant manager there and the general manager one time came and said to me and said, and we were talking and I said, I said, well, you know, I think there's going to be Gaither music in heaven. And they said, well, what about people that don't like Gaither music? I said, well, there are other alternatives or at least one other one anyway. <laughs> I was teasing with them. I was teasing with them. But I do like those Gaither videos. And... Sometimes uh, Bill Gaither, who's getting close to 90 now, he'll have where he will take a collection of songs that people have sung throughout the years on these various videos and he'll have a best of, you know, a best of this certain artist. And so, and while they're showing these clips in between, he'll sit there and he'll, he'll interview them. And without fail, if you watch those videos, those best of videos where they'll play, <clears throat> those videos have been on a long time. So sometimes you see this person that's been singing all these videos for 30 plus years. And while they used to be skinny and well, they used to have a full head of hair. Uh, anyway, not that I can relate to that. <laughs> but over 30 years, there's been some changes in the person, you know, as far as how they look. But they're all there and they're, they're singing to the Lord. And Bill, without fail, will ask them at the end. He'll say, what do you want people to say about you when you're gone? He'll ask them that every time. He may ask a lot of different questions, but he's even said when he talks about these videos, he says, I want to ask every person that because he's intrigued to see what thought people want to remain with their family, with their friends. And from this perspective, perhaps the fans of those who have listened to certain singers over the course of time. And it's interesting to hear what they say. If we were to ask the Apostle Paul, what do you want people to remember about you when you're gone? It would be, no doubt, grace. You look at the last chapter, and I've mentioned this before. You look at the last chapter of every book written by Paul, and he will not fail to mention grace. And so for the next uh, two or three weeks anyway, we're going to look at the last chapters of the books written by Paul through the inspiration of the Spirit. Of course, God being the ultimate author, but using his pen. And you'll see, he mentions grace at the end of each one. Why? Because grace is important to him. Not grace as this world might define it. You know, this world may define grace as maybe they see some believer 
and maybe the world, of course, the world system is an unbelieving system. But folks that are not believers, they may see others uh, at uh, restaurants and they see them before they dive into their food. They will say a quick prayer and they say, that's grace. Well, in a sense, that's grace. We talk about it that way. But that's not grace in the full extent that the Apostle Paul is talking about. Some in the world even, and unfortunately, even some of those who are professing believers, when they think of grace, they think of what I like to call cheap grace or greasy grace. And what I mean by that? They think that grace is somehow where it is that, well, somebody did you wrong or perhaps you did something else or something to them wrong and they end up saying, well, it's no big deal. Just forget it. I forgive you. And they view that as being grace. Well, there's an element of grace there in the sense of if you're forgiven and that hasn't been held to your charge, there's an element of grace there to be sure. But it's not grace in the totality that Scripture speaks of it. Grace, we sang about it this morning, and we'll sing, you know, I say we'll sing one next Sunday morning about grace, but we sing about grace most every time that we're in here, and for good reason. But the old hymn says, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Listen to the next line. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. You see, even when the world gets closer to a true definition of grace, speaking of forgiveness, speaking of not holding some transgression to somebody's account, they tend to think of it all, just forget it. Or they tend to think of it all, it really wasn't that important anyway. Or they tend to think of it, I'm going to say the right thing, but I'll hold it against you for the rest of your life and never tell you. You know, that, that's, how the, that's how the world tends to think about grace. But grace according to God, grace according to Scripture, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Grace is not God somehow forgiving the world by looking and saying, ah, no big deal. Your sin, no problem. Oh, you broke my law? Ah, forget about it. We just write it off like a tax write off. It's not like that, no. You see, God, we sing about it in the very next song. God not only has grace, God not only is loving, but God is holy. Not just holy, but holy, holy, holy. And so for Him to be holy, 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 no darkness at all, fullness of light, for Him to be perfectly righteous means that when His holy law is broken, when there are people who sin and who violate His law and who transgress by what they do, by what they say, by, by, by what it is they harbor in their heart, people that sin against His holy law, He can't, if He's a holy God, and He is holy, 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 He can't just look and say, ah, no big deal. Forget about it. No problem. No. We, th there is accountability for that. There is a judgment that must come for that. But aren't you thankful? Yonder on Calvary's mount out poured there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. For those who put their trust in Christ, rather than God's wrath being poured out upon you, if you repented of sin and put trust in Him, the holy, righteous wrath of God was poured out upon the Son, and He bore the penalty that we might be forgiven and free. Grace means forgiveness, but forgiveness at a price. And the price you couldn't pay, nor could I, but Jesus paid. Christ and Him crucified, which Paul said was His message, is the source of the grace of which Paul speaks. How many are thankful for grace? Yes. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Yeah. And so in the course of this message, of, of this series, two, two or three weeks long, let's see how far we get this morning. Well, you know, I'll stop at an hour and a half or two. Y'all yeah. got an extra hour of sleep, right? You're ready, you're pumped, right? Um, but at any rate, it is, uh, however long this is, I, I want to be sure that's at the front. Grace doesn't mean just writing things off. Grace doesn't mean something that makes you feel good because, well, you know, I got off. You know, Scott prayed. No, grace is there was a price paid. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? And you will also get a little feel, not only of the grace aspect of things, but a little introduction briefly, though it will be, to all of these books. First is Romans. Again, Romans not first written chronologically. That means according to time. But it is the first one that's in our Bibles written by the Apostle Paul. 
The church at Rome was a church that the Apostle Paul had never been to. Most of the churches that he writes to, he had been there before. In fact, he might even have been the founder of many of these churches. He had spent time there. But when Paul writes to the church at Rome and the book that we call Romans, he had never been there before. He had never, uh, he might have had some encounters with some of the people who were there during the course of his travels. And some of his travels haven't involved prison, <laughs> prison ministry, <laughs> Brother Todd, but, but uh, because he was thrown in jail for the gospel. But he, he had never been to that church. He didn't know all that group of believers, to be sure. And he writes through the inspiration of the Spirit this book called Romans. And I will tell you, I'm thankful for every book of Scripture because every word is inspired by God. But I will tell you, if you were to put me on a desert island and I could only have two books of the Scripture with me, it'd probably be the Gospel of John and the book of Romans. I, I would tell you, those are two of my favorites. And Romans is the nearest thing we have to what we would call a systematic theology. In other words, where Paul goes through in just such a God-inspired, obviously God-inspired way of talking about the doctrine of salvation. And when you read Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4 and 5, but especially those first two or three chapters, you know that you have sinned. Everybody has sinned. Jews that had the word of God in the Old Testament, they sinned. Gentiles who might not have known who these Old Testament prophets were, but they violated the conscience that God puts inside of each and every man. They know that they have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 will tell us. And if you read through there and you really consider all the phrases, you're like, yes, I've committed that sin and that sin and that sin. And even if you don't think yours is specifically listed, it will talk about how people worship the creation rather than the creator. They didn't worship God and neither were they thankful. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even if you don't think you've committed the biggies that are there. But you have. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then we come to Romans chapter 5. And it begins and it talks to believers. It says, therefore, having been justified or being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who Romans chapter 3 will tell us was both the just, the judge and the justifier. The one who paid the penalty for our sins. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. How many are thankful for that? Amen. Those who are in Christ indeed. If one has repented of sin and put trust in Christ. Your sins have now. They've been, they were paid for by his precious blood and you are free and you've not received a spirit of fear uh, 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 leading un un under bondage but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby you can cry out Abba Father and when it comes to the end of Romans chapter 16 the apostle Paul he doesn't want them to forget about grace and what does he say he says that that, uh, let's read it again here in verse uh, 19. I don't want to misquote the order here. It says at the end of verse 19, I want you to be wise in what is good, innocent in what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. The first point I want to make about grace from these verses that are at the end of Romans that Paul would want us to focus upon is this. Grace makes it where we can be excellent at what is good and innocent of evil. Be wise my translation, I don't use New American Standard, says be wise. Some translations be, be excellent. Both of them make a good point because how many know apart from God's grace, apart from God's word, you could not be wise to even know truly what was good and what was evil. How many know everyone has somewhat of a conscience that God will put in? But how many know the more that you know the Lord, that conscience is informed by the word of God. Things you used to think were okay, you found out weren't okay. Things you used to mock and make fun of if it is that you would see things before you were a believer. Now you know those are good and right. How many are thankful? Grace lets you know what is good. Grace lets you know what is right. Grace lets you know what is wrong. And that's the way that we can know how many are thankful for that. And not only be wise or be excellent at uh, what is good and innocent of evil as far as the knowledge be wise, but be excellent. 
How many know, before coming to know Christ, you could not truly do something that was good or stay away from something that was evil? You say, well, now wait a minute. Even before I came to know Christ, I did some pretty good things. Do you know what Scripture says? Scripture says in a verse I, I quote often, Isaiah 64, 6, Our righteousness, us on our best day, if we know not Christ, is as filthy rags before Him. We may think, oh, we're doing good. We're doing good before God. I know a lot of people, they'll say, well, I didn't have a good day today, but I had a good day yesterday. In fact, I even know some people that go to church. I remember one time I was in a conversation. This one person was talking about how, unfortunately, they had been on their way somewhere. And they had cussed up the storm because the person had uh, someone had pulled out in front of them, all this, and they had all this. And then someone that they knew told them, says, well, that's why you go to church on Sunday, see? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you didn't have time to unpack all that in that moment. But some people have those, have those ideals. But can I tell you, if we're not in Christ, then any good thing that we would say, that we would do, anything that would please God, how many know if you're not in Christ, you're not in the acceptable offering, so to speak, in the acceptable sacrifices. And only if you are in Christ are these things then have uh, any kind of, um, you know, any kind of fruit to them that would be good and lasting. How many want to have good and lasting fruit for God? Want to be excellent at what is good, wise to what is good, to not only know it, but to do it. And not only to know what is evil, but to be to, to stay away from it. How many wanted that to be? The source of that is not going to be your own strength or your own wisdom or your own knowledge. It will come just from yourself or certainly from any worldly philosophy. It will come from knowing and walking in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which has been extended to you if you are a believer. And of which you grow in as you study his word. And he pours out the grace for us to know it and to walk in it and the power of his spirit. How many know are thankful for grace? Grace lets us know. And can I tell you, grace too is what will crush. Look here at the verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your what? Feet. Grace not only lets us know what is good and evil, do what is good, stay away from evil. But grace is what puts the devil underfoot. You say, well, how does that happen? Well, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis Written hundreds and hundreds of centuries before the book of Romans. And when mankind fell in the Garden of Eden, what was the promise that God said? God said uh, to the serpent, he said, his judgment was, there's going to come one from the seed of woman that though you bruise his heel, where's the heel? In the foot. Though you bruise his heel, he will crush your how many are thankful when Jesus died upon the cross to bring grace to you and me? That grace of God poured out through the work of the Son. Crushed Satan right underneath his feet. Amen. And if you're in Christ, that's good news. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that brings good news. The gospel of grace that puts Satan to flight. Aren't you thankful? Look here next. The next book, if you were to continue to go to the right in your Bible written by Paul, is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16 is where we'll be at. And as you may have guessed, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians has 16 verses in it. Or 16 chapters, I'm sorry, 16 chapters. So again, we're in the last chapter. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 21, if you're there, say amen. amen. It says, the greeting is in my own hand, Paul. Now, uh, this is not necessarily the main point of the message by any means, but just a little information here. When you see Paul talk about the greeting being written in his own hand, many times Paul would use what's called an amanuensis. That's simply amanuensis is a fancy term for like a secretary. And he would quote these things to his secretary. And they would write, a, but to make sure that it was him and not somebody trying to trick them, he would oftentimes do part of it in his own hand where they would recognize, hey, yeah, this, this has Paul uh, as an apostle, his seal of approval. So he says, the greeting is in my own hand, Paul. Verse 22. Now, this is proof positive. We read through the Bible too fast. Listen to this. See if this doesn't make your head spin a little bit. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, I want to say make your head spin. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be a curse. Maranatha, come on, Jesus. And then, then he talks about the grace of the Lord. Be with you all who love the Lord. 
Can I tell you what grace will cause us to do? Grace causes us to love the Lord. Scripture will say in 1 John, we love him because he first what? Loved us. Loved us. Grace. So much could be said about it. And we say a lot about it here. We'll say a lot about it in the next two or three weeks as we look at these grace-filled verses at the end of Paul's letters. But one good definition, or at least one good aspect, one good quality of when you think about grace, it's God's initiative. No one takes the first step toward God. No one. Man went and hid in the Garden of Eden, and it says in Psalms, and then it repeated again in the book of Romans, there is none who does good, none who understands, none who seeks after God. Jesus said himself, when speaking in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, by Zacchaeus, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the cause. Who doesn't seek? God's the one doing the, the, the seeking. And here it is, is that we come to the church at Corinth. Corinth was a very wicked, sinful town. In fact, even the heathen of the day, if they wanted to uh, criticize the ethics of somebody else, even though their ethics weren't so good, if they wanted to criticize someone else, say, you're really bad. Right? They'd say, you Corinthian. Because Corinthian was known for being very wicked. All right? You might be a wicked person living in a wicked city, but Corinth, Corinth was your lowest common denominator. Corinth was the one that you would point to so you could feel better about yourself. <laughs> it was, it, right? In fact, if they, if they did commercials back then, it might have been what happens in Corinth stays in. Court. How many know sin never stays, though, right? It always follows around. But here it is, is that Corinth was one of these most wicked places. And I will tell you, what does God choose to do through the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul did know Corinth. He knew that church. He stayed there a, a long time, the leader in that church for for what for him would have been a long time, all right, but uh, uh, not over decades, but over a year and a half. That for Apostle Paul was a long time. He'd stay there, and when he went there to Corinth, how many know, isn't it just like God to pick the most wicked city and start a church there? And not only start a church there, but start a church there that would have letters written to it that we would still read 2,000 years later. How I many that, that, that's just like God, isn't it? And I got good news. The Apostle Paul, and we'll talk more about this for the end of the sermon this morning, but if you're familiar with the biography of the Apostle Paul, he, of course, was not always a believer. He used to be a persecutor of the church. He would say he is chief of sinners. And he would say it is a good and trustworthy statement that God came to save sinners amongst whom he was chief. And he would basically make the argument, if God would come and would save him, then there's hope for you. How many know if it is that God would start a church in Corinth and his gospel go forth in Corinth, that, there, that there's hope springs eternal. Aren't you thankful for that? Think about Brother Kevin and Brother Rick and Brother Adam and others. But I know those three who went down to Key West. How many know Key West is one of those Corinth kind of places today, right? And I, my wife and son and I, we went down to Key West one time during the daytime. We took a picture of that boy down there that says... Uh, uh, southernmost point. You guys, how many seen that, right? Boy or boy or Louis. what they said? B U O Y, right? And it says that we got pictures there, and then we got in the car, hit the gas, hit the door. We weren't going to stay there later than that. But Brother Kevin was saying some of the awful things that he would see people do and behave down there. But aren't you thankful? You may say, well, why would someone go there? Why would someone share the gospel there? Or you may think of, like Brother Todd, he goes into the jail. And Now, listen, are there some innocent people there who have not committed the crimes of which they're charged? Yes. But truth be told, do most turn out guilty in some respect or other? Most likely. Have some been in there dozens and dozens of times? Why bring the gospel to the jail? Why bring the gospel to Key West? Because the gospel went to Corinth. And there were people there who were saved. How many are thankful? God, when, when his gospel goes forth, God can save to the uttermost Amen. those who will put their trust in him, whatever be. There's, aren't you thankful for that? Yes. And grace, those who have truly received it. Again, notice he talks about grace and loving the Lord. Grace will cause us to love the Lord. How many are thankful to the Lord for the grace you've received? Amen. And the more that you realize how much grace you've received. You see, Jesus says it this way himself. He who's been forgiven little, 
loves little. He who's been forgiven much loves. And I can't tell you, if you've been forgiven by God, there ain't anybody who's been forgiven little. It's just maybe you realize it little. How many want to realize it more and more? And if you've been forgiven much, you love much. Why? Because grace will cause us to love. To love the Lord. We don't watch much TV show other than we watch the, the if we watch one local news so we get the weather at least once a day so we know what's happening with it. But we don't watch many shows that are on TV. You can't hardly take the commercials. But when it is that we were, we uh, one show that we have watched some of over the course of time, and I don't even know if it's still in existence or not, this show called Undercover Boss. Anybody heard of it? Yes. And where the, the CEO of some big company, they go and they... They disguise themselves and they work amongst the various, uh, uh, you know, uh, employees and stations or whatever their company might be. Some don't do a good job and they kind of get it at the end when the boss reveals their identity. But there's some of them, most of them are trying to do a pretty good job. And at the end of these shows, some of them can almost be tearjerkers because at the end of some of these shows, here's this boss, this CEO of this big company. And here's someone that's worked for them for perhaps a long time. And they've got, maybe it is that one of their relatives has a medical need. Or it could be that they're almost homeless. Or they don't have a way to get to it. And at the end, I mean, they get a new home. Or they get a new car. Or they get something from the CEO of this company. And I tell you, the tears boiled up from these people. And so, truth be told, sometimes in your eyes too, to see how much it was that this made a difference in that person's life. And without fail, one of the common sentiments that come from people that receive this will say, things like this don't happen to people like me. Right? right? Things like this don't happen to people like me. Nobody notices and hears someone's note. Nobody knows the need. And yet someone here see and, and they've done something. Things like this don't happen to people like me. So at the end of the program, they'll talk about how three months later and they'll show these different people. You know, that they had on the show. And almost without fail, they're still working for the company. And why is that? Well, they just got shown a lot of grace. How could you not want to be somewhat loyal to the company that just gave you so much? Can I tell you? I don't know what it is that you may have received or what your station of life is as far as socioeconomic. But I know this. If you're a believer, something has been done for you that's far greater than all this world's silver and gold wrapped into one. The King of kings and the Lord of lords has died on the cross to pay for your sins. And you could rightly say, things like this don't happen to people like me because you didn't deserve it. That's for sure. But how many are thankful? Our great God, He tends to do because He is loving, gracious, compassionate. Full of loving kindness and truth. He gave his life on a cross. And the more that you realize that. The more you're going to love him. Because you realize how much it is that he has done. You want to follow after him. With all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And you pray Lord help me. To follow after you more tomorrow. Than today. And more the next day than tomorrow. How many want to love the Lord. Realize how much grace has been extended to you. And you will love him more. Look here next. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 11 to 14 says this. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. Look at verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The point I'm going to make from this, it might sound a little high-minded, so to speak, but it's, it, it's, it, it bears importance. Is it grace, right? We talked from Romans. Grace lets us be wise to know and to be excellent to do what is good, be innocent of evil, and crushes Satan underneath our feet. From 1 Corinthians, grace Causes us to love God when we realize how much it is that we have received. Third is this. What does grace do? Or what is grace? Grace is Trinitarian. Notice we sang this morning. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Right? And how does it end? God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. 
And notice here, we believe that there is one God, yes. But there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And I will tell you, when it is that you look at the, the, this, this verse that we just looked at from the end of 2 Corinthians, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the fellowship of the Spirit, be with you all. Notice, Father, Son, Spirit, all mentioned here, right? And it says, it begins with the grace of our Lord Jesus. Can I tell you, there are some people that associate Jesus as being gracious. And that's New Testament. But God the Father is mean. And that's in the Old Testament. He's the one, you know, for the Father above. He is. You know, the, one of the songs says, The Father above, He is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little ears, watch your hear eyes. But how many remember that old song? Right? There's another one that says, Oh, be careful, little ears, watch your hear. For the Father above, He will squash you like a bug. No. <laughs> then we go to second verse. No, I'm kidding. But there are some people they think of, and then when they think of the spirit, they think of the spirit as being basically just like a force almost. No, our God, there is one God, but tri-personal God, this Godhead, three in one, in a way that defies our understanding, to be sure. But do understand this. Even though the persons of the Godhead are associated with different kind of works. What I mean by that. Typically, the Father is associated with creation. And the uh, Son is associated with the ideal of redemption upon the cross. And the Spirit is associated with that of, uh, uh, of convicting uh, sinners and of illuminating the saints. And all those are good connections. But a good doctrine of the Trinity realizes you cannot fully divorce or separate one job, if you will, or one work of one person of the Trinity from the other persons of the Trinity. It's not as if, and see, this is part of what causes people, too, to misunderstand the cross. I've heard some people, they will say, well, I'm not going to believe in Jesus because this message of Christianity, it looks to me like it's just cosmic child abuse. The father, he's just letting the son have it. What kind of earthly father even would do that to their son? How is it that we can respect a God who would do such? They misunderstand the Trinity is only one of their many problems. But why do I say misunderstand? It's because of this. When you read the totality of Scripture, the plan of redemption was before the foundation of the earth. The son, the lamb who was slain, slain before the foundation of the earth. Even when sinners nailed Jesus to the godless men nailed his hands and feet to the cross. Acts chapter 2 will say it was according to the predetermined plan of God. Jesus said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. But Jesus also said, he said, this is my life. No one takes it from me. I laid it down of my own accord. And if I lay it down, I have the power to raise it back up again. You see, we cannot wholly relate to there being such a harmony as there is in the person of God, which is the tri-personal God. We can't, and again, God is not uh, three separate, but is indeed, I mean, in a sense, distinct, yet three in one. You can't get, and I, this analogy breaks down, so I hate to use it, but how many know you can't get three people in a room and them agree about everything? How many know you can't get yourself in the room and agree about everything? <laughs> how many disagree with yourself? You haven't thought, no, that ain't right. No, this ain't right. But how many ever done that before? You ever argued with yourself? The good news is you win every time. Bad news is you, well, <laughs> right? But here it is. We cannot fully relate to the interactions of the persons of the Godhead who is three, yet one. We can't, but I will give you this. I, I want you to know this. The grace that was extended to you by Jesus' work on the cross, it is not against the will of the Father. It was the will of the Father. The grace that was given to you by Jesus Christ dying upon the cross, it is not against the will of the Spirit. For indeed, it's the Spirit of God who would convict you of sin, righteousness, and of judgment and draw you unto the work of Christ upon the cross. How many are thankful the grace of God is Trinitarian? There's not one person of the Trinity saying, no, don't show him grace. <laughs> no, please, you know. no. How many are thankful that the God has three in one? Grace is Trinitarian. In fact, I've shared this before in messages on the Trinity. Every analogy breaks down somewhere. 
of the Trinity. There's nothing we can say that's fully going to express for us the doctrine of the Trinity. But I will tell you this. One of my favorite that I've heard is this. How many know whether in a, a family relationship, a romantic relationship, a friendship, that there is love that you have for another person, right? And then there's the love that not only that you have it, but if you have it, that love has to find expression, right? In some manner. In other words, you can have love for somebody in your heart, or at least say that you do, but that love needs to be expressed in some way, right? How many of you have said, actions speak louder than words, right? But then, there not only is a love that one would have, and not only a love that is expressed, but that love, how many know sometimes that love that one has, and that love that's expressed is somehow either not received by the other person, again, whatever be the nature of the relationship, family, a romantic relationship or friendship, if sometimes it's rejected by the other person or misunderstood by the other person, right? That can happen. And so the, one of the best illustrations I've heard of the doctrine of the Trinity, the Father has love. Jesus, the expression of that love, dying upon the cross for God demonstrated his love for us and while we as soon as Christ died upon the cross for us. And the Spirit, being the person of the Godhead associated with the believer being able to receive that as the love of God. How many are thankful for the grace of God? Trinitarian. Look here next. Galatians chapter 6 verses 14 to 18. Paul says this. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. And the point made from here is grace is what makes the people of God to be the people of God. What do I mean by that? When you look at Galatians, again, I told you, as we go through these books, I'm going to give you a little bit of, just a little synopsis or a little background on the book. The church at Galatia, like the, there was a church at the city of Corinth. There was a church at the city of Rome. When we get to it later on, there's a church at the city of Thessalonica. The church of Galatia, there's no city of, Galatia is like a region. Like if you ever watch the news and they'll say, Fort Myers is going to be 93 today and Santa Bell's going to be 94. It's going to be hot across southwest Florida, right? And so Galatia's like a region. So there were a few churches involved when this letter was written. It's a, it's a region, not just one specific city. And so uh, this, by the way, the book of Galatians, only six chapters long, is the first chronologically written book, and most likely, of Paul uh, in the New Testament. And perhaps the earliest book of the New Testament altogether is the book of Galatians. These six wonderful chapters. And when you read the book of Galatians, part of what happened there is Paul had went preaching the gospel in these churches in this region of Galatia. And behind him came some false teachers. How many of they always come? And these false teachers come behind Paul. And they'll basically, I'm oversimplifying here, but they basically say, Jesus, great. Grace, great. But if you want to be saved, you've got to do X, Y, and Z of the works of the law as well. Well, now, how many know we should want to do what's right? If you're saved, you should want to do what is right. But if you think that somehow you doing, quote, unquote, what is right saves you, you are thinking wrong. Your works are not saving you. Your works are the fruit of salvation, not the root of salvation. Okay? And so here it is, is that what transpires here is there's some Judaizers, false teachers come along and say, no, you've got to do X, Y, and Z from the... From the law. Even Peter. How many have heard of Peter? I tell you, when you think of Paul, you think that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And indeed he is. But the first apostle to preach the gospel to the Gentiles was Peter. In Acts chapter uh, 10 in the house of Cornelius. But here it is. is that, that Paul, he's, he's preached the true gospel. These false teachers come along and say, no, you've got to fulfill these works of the law. Peter did not preach the uh, heresy of these Judaizers. He never preached that you're saved by works of the law. But he started hanging out with them, so to speak. He was hypocritical insofar as he used to eat with the Gentiles, but now he doesn't eat with the Gentiles. Read Galatians chapter 2. Peter and Paul, they had a, they had a, they had a, uh, uh, 
an argument, you might say. <laughs> and, and, and Paul did most of the talking. <laughs> Paul comes and he confronts Peter. And you know what? Peter doesn't correct Paul because Peter realized he needed to be corrected. Paul comes and says, no, Peter, you know that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And I mentioned that you may recall some moments ago that this is spelled out perhaps the best in the book of Romans. But if you read the book of Galatians, the book of Romans is, I mean, there are some uh, distinctions as well. But the book of Romans is kind of like an expanded book of Galatians in many ways, talking about the grace. And part of the argument that Paul makes in the book of Galatians is we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works of the law. And he will go on to say that those who are of the seed of Abraham, the lineage of Abraham, as far as according to the, the, the flesh, aren't necessarily the, the ones in view here. It's those who have put faith in Christ. You also, but you're, you're the people of God if you put your trust in Christ. Because he says circumcision is nothing. Neither is uncircumcision. But grace through faith in Christ. How many are thankful? Though you were born of the physical lineage of Abraham. If indeed you're a child of God. You're part. You can say Abraham, Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them. And so are you if you're in Christ. How many are thankful for that? So let's just pray. No, I won't sing that song. <laughs> How many remember? I hate it. I didn't like that song. Was it, it involved a lot. <laughs> right? <laughs> I like the words pretty good. But. But then you'd sing them over and over, and at the end you were exhausted because it had motions with it. At the end. If you're not familiar with that, bless your heart. <laughs> Here it is. It's in the book of Galatians. Paul wants to make it known. If you're part of the people of God, it doesn't mean that God's forgotten his people Israel. That read Romans. There's still a plan for them. But in some ways they're set aside for a period of time. But aren't you thankful that you are grafted in if you're in Christ? Aren't you thankful for that? And it says, these folks that hated each other. How many know all throughout the ages there are groups that hate each other for various reasons? Right? Well, Jew and Gentile, they, were, they, they did not get along. The Jews would even call the Gentiles dogs. And they didn't mean it in the friend of them. You know, some of my kids today would say, hey, dog. And they mean, that's a good thing. But dogs, when you called each other dogs back in the Bible, they not, not a compliment. Not a compliment, okay? And, and they would call Gentiles dogs because they looked down upon them. They're people without the law. They're uncircumcised and all the rest of it. And Paul says this. If indeed you're in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. And he wasn't talking about our problem we got in our day and age. He was talking about this. If you are in Christ, you are forgiven in Christ. And you're part of the family of God. That's good news. How are you thankful you're part of the family of God by grace? Amen. Old Gaither's song. You know, Gaither's have a lot of good songs. It talks about the family of God. And it says this, from the door of an orphanage to the house of a king. In other words, wherever you're at on that spectrum. If you're in Christ, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, wherever you're at in that spectrum. From the weak to the strong, wherever you're at in that spectrum. If you're in Christ, you can say... I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. Amen. That's good news, amen. Amen. amen, through Christ. Look here lastly for this morning. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23 says this. Peace be to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Can I tell you, grace joins us in love not only with God, which we have talked about already, and not only makes us a part of the family, which we've talked about already, but we also love the family of God. I've mentioned this before. I heard it once said that there are people that are your relatives. And, well, you love them in the sense that you might have Thanksgiving with them. That don't mean you want to go on vacation with them. <laughs> right? right? But and there, you might be a part of the family of God. And I've heard it said by one... One uh, pastor one time uh, that I read his book, he said, you know, there's this old saying, to live with the saints above, that will be such glory. But to live with the saints below, now that's another story. <laughs> right? And all of us have found that to be the case in some regard. But I would tell you, there's some people that would say amen to that this point. And they thinking of you. <laughs> right? But can I tell you, here's the, here's the thing. In the book of Ephesus, the Ephesians, by the way. Paul was used by God in that church and he was part of the leadership. When you read the book of Acts, 
When Paul saw them for the last time, there was, there was great distress because they had such great love. And Paul told them false teachers would come in the future. We read the book of Timothy. How many of you ever read Timothy? Or you know the name of Timothy, no doubt. He was one who would be pastor of the church at Ephesus. One of the pastors. When you read John in the book of Revelation, one of the messages, in fact, the first message is to the church at Ephesus. John was a leader in that church as well. So Ephesus is an important church back in those old, uh, back in the uh, uh, early Bible days, early, early New Testament church. And here it is, it's written that the love of God in Christ Jesus will also cause us not only to be a part of the family of God, but to love the family of God. I remember there's... Uh, a, a, a Christian uh, a podcaster or radio person that I listen to as I download, I listen to as I have time. And this particular fellow, he used to be involved in worldly entertainment. He used to be a stand-up comic. And he was trying to be at the top of his field. He was trying to make a name for himself. He was trying to make money. And, and he was trying to, you know, rise in the ranks. And as he's doing it, you know, he looked and he said he, said he had grown up being somewhat in church. He even thought he was going to study to be in the ministry, to be a pastor, and then found out he wasn't saved because <laughs> he never really put trust in the Lord. And so he's a stand-up comic, and he's rising in the comic ranks. And he said, you know, I looked down upon church people then. He said, potlucks? Who wants that? He said, I want, a, I want a, something fancy. He said, you know, and, you know, all this thing about, you know, you come, you get sing, I, why not? I mean, you Sometimes you sing out of tune for crying out loud. We need some professionals in here, you know. And he looked down upon church people and church things. But now, thanks be to God, being the saved child of God, he, and he was making confession. He says, I used to look down. On this. He said, now, he said, I love to go to a potluck. He says, and I don't care if they sing out of key or out of tune or whatever it might be, as long as they're singing unto Jesus and believing in him, the Savior. He said, because the people of God were precious to him. And I will tell you, if you're a born-again child of God who knows of His grace, you're going to love other people that know the grace of God too. Amen. The love of God in Christ Jesus. The grace that you've received. I'll close with this. The series, I started to call this little series like Amazing Grace after the famous hymn, you know. Amazing grace. But I, I, I'm going to call it this Grace Links Part 1. You say, what is a grace link? Well... For those who don't know computers too well, you might have to follow me here in this a little bit, but those of you who know computer, 29 year olds and under, all right, you'll know about this. Some of you far better than I because, well, computers, I remember a time when there wasn't a computer in every house. Yeah, I mean, me too. Right? I remember we didn't grow up with a computer. We had typewriters. <laughs> we'll see those anymore. And before that, there was, you know, Morse code. No, I wouldn't have that. <laughs> but at any rate, you know if you do any surfing on the internet, which is the only kind of surfing to do, I didn't say, because uh, I, uh, yeah, right? If, you, if you're on that World Wide Web, you might go to a certain website, and then as you read, there's something that's interests you, and you click on a link. Those of you who get the, uh, uh, the, 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 the link to the church things, you click on a link. I don't know how that works. I just know you click on that link, you touch it on your phone, or if you're on the computer, you do that mouse click, and it takes you to something. Anybody ever been doing that on the internet before you know it, an hour's gone by, and you're at somewhere way far away from where you started? Anybody ever done that before? It was all, and somehow the computer knows what your interests are. Google knows these things, right? You ever been on there, and you're like... How does it know that I like Southern gospel music and this thing pops up? How does it know this, you know? But I will tell you, the reason I'm saying Grace Link is because of this. If you were to click there for an hour and end up somewhere, and again, some people do that and end up no good places on the computer, but that's not what I'm referring to. But you click on things that interest you and all along it interests you for an hour and it's been a good thing. You can trace that good thing you're experiencing all the way back to the original thing. Can I tell you here this morning, there are a lot of people, even people in the world, you ask them, what do you want? The world peace? They want people to love each other. They want people to live in peace and harmony and give the world a coke and a smile, right? They want this sort of thing. 
They want that. They want to feel like they belong. You know, that's the reason why some people turn to gangs. Because as bad as they are, at least they feel like they belong in some way. Right? And so people want these sort of... People want to have victory. They might not even believe in Satan, but they want bad things under their feet. Right? There are people that don't believe in God, don't believe in Scripture, but they, but they would surely like, again, to have the wrong underneath their feet. They want to do better or be better, many of them anyway. But they, of course, have their definition of what that is, which most oftentimes, if not all the time, is not a scriptural definition. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people, even in the world, that want the blessings we just talked about that grace brings. But I'm here to tell you, you can't get to the end without the beginning. That's right. In other words, people are not going to love each other and love God unless they know the grace that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. People are not going to be excellent at what is good and innocent of evil unless they know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. They're not going to realize these blessings which they would want without the giver of the blessing and the blessing of Christ Jesus dying for our sins upon the cross, the source of grace. Yeah. And aren't you thankful for grace? Yeah. And the way it links to every area of the Christian's life. How many want to walk in grace? Amen. Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we come before you today. We thank you for the grace. The grace that's found in Christ and in him alone. Dying upon the cross for our sins. All of us sin and falling short of the glory of God. All of us in need of the forgiveness that only comes through his shed blood and his sacrifice. You, the holy, holy, holy God. The only true and living God who will not let the wicked go unpunished. It doesn't let sin just go because to do so would be to compromise your righteous character. And yet, you, God, are also loving and gracious. You sent your son to die upon a cross to take that penalty, that punishment upon himself for all who would repent and put trust in him. And Lord, if there's any here this morning that know not Christ, they've never repented of sin and put trust in him. They do not know genuinely of the grace of God. Maybe they realize that in their heart and mind. Or perhaps they'd be convicted by your spirit this morning. Having thought that they had put trust in Christ. But yet they realize now they're kind of trusting in this or that. Or the other thing for salvation and not in grace. God I pray this morning that if they're beginning to know not Christ. They will be convicted by your spirit of sin. And convinced by your spirit and your word of salvation is found in Christ alone and come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children, whether of recent or many years, even decades of our life, we thank you that your grace, your grace, not our own strength, but your grace will make us excellent what is good, innocent of evil, both in wisdom and in deed. And through your grace, we have victory over the devil. Through your grace, we love the Lord. Through your grace, which is Trinitarian Father, Son, and Spirit. But through your grace, we are the people of God. And we love you, Lord. And we love our brothers and sisters, the church. We love the family of God. We thank you for your wondrous, amazing, marvelous, undeserved grace. Lord, minister to my brothers and sisters again in every area of life for which they have need. May they grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray in the power of the Spirit we come and all of God's people said. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you give you peace. May you know it is the whole pure calling of God in Christ Jesus. And the surpassing greatness of his power extend to all who believe. Amen and amen. amen. In Jesus' name be blessed.